Bless the Lord, O my soul. Blessed art thou, O Lord. Okay, uh, this is our seventh out of eight sessions. We have looked at uh, lunch in the garden and what began to be the results of uh, that episode with Adam and Eve. And then we looked at uh, the Christmas story uh, last week. And tonight then we come to the Pascha story. Uh, speaking of God's trilogy, Adam and Eve lost paradise. They lost the ability to see the kingdom of God. They lost the ability to hear the kingdom of God, and therefore they lost the ability to live in the kingdom of God. They chose death, and the life of God that fills paradise began to fade from their view, began to drain away until Adam and Eve were only left with living in death. Life withdrew from them, and they found themselves on the outside of life. They were expelled, as it were, excluded from paradise. They were banished from paradise into this world of death. They became refugees wandering in the strange land of death. We tend to think geographically. They were expelled from a particular location. But geography is they were expelled existentially and ontologically. We dealt with all of that pre previously. If you can't see and you can't hear what's in the room, it, for all intents and purposes, it doesn't exist for you but it hadn't ceased to exist in the room. What happened to Adam and Eve was they, in choosing death, if you do that, you die. Death happened. They lost the eyesight, began to dim. They couldn't see what they used to see. They couldn't hear what they used to hear. They ended up being claustrophobic in just the world of their literal five senses. What they once saw, they no longer could see they could no longer hear. The kingdom of God disappeared, though still present. It became absent to them. They were banished from the realm of life to the realm of death. Life drained out of them, and they became walking dead men. But in the fullness of time, God's plan of restoration reached fulfillment. God's purpose for mankind had never changed. Mankind's purpose, mankind's goal was to become like God. What Adam failed to achieve, what each of us has failed to achieve, God achieved on our behalf. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. As St. Athanasius stated and the Orthodox Church has affirmed, God became man so that we could become God, could become like God. The purpose of creation is this union with God to become like the image of God within us, to unite our behavior with our identity. Union with God is thus called theosis or deification. Both words are used in the church. In the fullness of time, God undertook the restoration of mankind to paradise. This restoration involved three distinct steps. The incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. These three steps are the incarnation, the crucifixion, and the resurrection. Uh, I say that because in the West, 
we only think of the crucifixion. Uh, the incarnation was just so we had a victim to hang on the cross. Uh, hanging on the cross uh, was the central moment in Western theology, and the resurrection is a footnote uh, to have an exit stage left, uh, for all intents and purposes. But we are seeing the organic whole that the incarnation, crucifixion, and the resurrection are a united act by God, our restoration to paradise in those three separate steps. It is God's plan restored. You see, Adam did not fulfill his vocation. Adam and Eve did not achieve the purpose for which they were created. They did not achieve theosis, this union with God, but the plan of God was not destroyed by the sin of man. The vocation of the first Adam was fulfilled by Christ, the second Adam. God became man in order that man might become God. To use the words of Irenaeus and Athanasius, echoed by the fathers and theologian of every age. According to St. Gregory of Nyssa, the infinite distance between the created and the uncreated, that natural separation of man from God, which ought to have been overcome by this act of deification on our part, became an impassable abyss for mankind after we had willed ourselves into this new state, a state of sin and death, which was near a state of non-existence, non-being. In order to reach that union with God, to which the creature is called, it was then necessary to break through the triple barrier of sin, death, and nature. This path of theosis, deification, becoming like God, that was planned for Adam and Eve, became impossible after they chose death instead of life. The divine plan was not fulfilled by Adam. Instead of the straight line of ascent towards God, the will of the first man followed a path contrary to nature, contrary to how we were created and carrying the image in us, and ending in death. What mankind ought to have attained by raising himself up to God, God achieved by descending to us. That is why the triple barrier which separates us from God, death, sin, and nature, impassable for us, is broken through by God in the reverse order which would be, is going to be done by nature, sin, and death. In fact, Nicholas Cabasius, a Byzantine theologian of the 14th century, expressed it exactly that way. The Lord allowed men separated from God by the triple barrier of nature, sin, and death. Nature, sin, and death. So let's just remind ourselves we have nature, human nature separates us from the divine nature, sin, our acts of saying no to the things of God, and then the death that is at work in us, that, that which is life and the living of life, the living God, has nothing to do with death and is separated from it. So these three things, human nature, human sin, and human death, separate us from a relationship 
with God. And so God in restoring us, Adam and Eve had this is the result then of the garden, the act of uh, eating that which brought death, choosing death over life. And now God in his restoration of mankind to give us the opportunity for paradise yet again is going to have to conquer nature, sin, and death for us to be restored. That brings us then, first of all, in nature to the incarnation. I know it's a beautiful day outside and we're coming here and we're going, what do we do and have to think this hard about this kind of stuff? We just do. You have to plow the field to put the seeds in before you can get a harvest. And so we have to always do a little bit of legwork of working and hoeing in the garden so that the crop will come up. The division, the separation of God's nature and our nature is overcome in the incarnation of Christ who is fully God and fully man. So whatever gulf is there, God has overcome it by himself becoming one of us. For St. Maximus, the incarnation, sarcosis in the Greek, and deification, theosis, correspond to one another. Incarnation and becoming like God correspond to each other because they mutually imply the other. In the incarnation, you have uh, the person of Christ who is fully God and then fully man. God descends to the world and becomes man, and thereby man is raised towards divine fullness and becomes God. Because this union of the two natures, the divine and the human, has been determined in the eternal counsel of God and it, it, because it is the final end for which everything has been created out of nothing in the first place. Wow, that's huge. All we have to at least understand at this moment is you have in Christ no separation. Well, there's, they're not mixed as a mixture but you have fully God and fully man, the, the natures being united together. God became flesh and dwelt among us. God became the second Adam to remind us and to show us what we are to become. Christ was fully God and fully man. The incarnate, what page are we on in the book, by the way? 146. 146, 146 in the book. The incarnation unites the two natures, the divine and the human together. The incarnation also sets before us our goal and our purpose to become godlike. Uh, we are meant to unite the divine and the human within ourselves. You, therefore, this concept of theosis is not just generic, it's personal. This is something that involves each one of us in our own lives of beginning to acquire godlikeness in our behavior, beginning to behave like the image of God we carry already in us. Now, in the West, spirituality often is defined at the expense of the human. We've dealt with this previously. The more spiritual one becomes, the less human they seek to become. But Christ was fully God and fully man. Theosis becoming like God is not a negation of being human. We live in a world of death, and our humanity is less 
than the full humanity Adam and Eve had at creation. They could see what we can't see. They could hear what we can't hear. Uh, they, they could sense what we don't sense. We have lost our, our eyesight. We have lost our hearing. We have lost the life of God coursing through our lives. The incarnation, therefore, points us to our beginning in paradise and points us to our humanity that we have lost. We are less than we were created to be when we were first created. Theosis, becoming like God, involves growing in our humanity as well as in becoming like God. Christ was fully God and fully man. I know you're getting hard to talk to me saying it, but it, it's, it, it's not just something out there. It's something you see that is impacting us and is part of our own restoration to paradise that is happening. Theosis, becoming like God, involves growing in our humanity as well as becoming like God. But we are not yet fully human. The incarnation opens the door for us to become once again who we were when we were first created, fully human, to begin to hear what we can't hear and to see what we can't see about the things of God. So that gulf between us and God has been overcome in Christ and is part of our restoration, making it possible for us to begin achieving that vocation in our own lives. That brings us then to sin that is to be overcome and the crucifixion It is the crucifixion. I'm a lousy speller when I'm on the board. Probably a lousy speller when I'm off the board. But at least when I'm trying to write here. The, the crucifixion removes, removes the barrier of sin that our weakened wills and causes us to fail in our own becoming like God. It is our weakened will that causes us to fail. St. Gregory of Nyssa said it this way, sin is an invention of the created will. It is the created will that chooses to do something that isn't good for us. It isn't the devil that makes us sin. Oh, well, the devil made me do it. No, it is not the devil that made us sin. It is our own weak will. Since Adam and Eve's failure to say no to death and yes to life, we now lack the willpower to say yes to life and no to death. The term armartia, sin, means simply to miss the mark, to aim at a target and miss the bullseye. It means to fail at one's purpose, to miss the point, the bullseye. Armartia, in its largest sense, means to miss the point of one's own life. At my chrismation, coming into the Orthodox faith, I entered the church as Ezra. I was drawn to this Old Testament prophet because Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. Even though I was not a teacher, 
there was a cry within me to do the same. I mentioned this because I never knew I was a teacher. I did not know this is who I am. I was over 40 years old and did not know who I was vocationally. I had lived my whole life missing the point of my vocational life. I thank God that he showed me who I was while there was still some time left to be who I am. It was by discovering who I am in my humanity that I also discovered who we are created to be as a person. We are created by God and with free will. We are to choose to become like God, like the image of God within us. We live in a world of sin, a world that misses the point of life. I was blind to my own identity vocationally, but in a far greater sense, I was blind and mankind is blind to its own identity. We are missing the point of our own lives, the point of our own creation, to become like the image of God within us. We don't need to buy a book that tells us how to have a purpose in life. We are created for a purpose, and that purpose is to walk with God in the cool of the evening and become like Him. We exist because God has called us by name. Our purpose is to become who God meant us to be when he called each of us by name. Sin is the product of a weak will. The good I want to do, I fail to do, while the evil I don't want to do, I do anyway. Sin is an issue of our weakened will. I have good intentions to go home after work and mow the yard, clean the spare room, read a book, or do my exercises. But when I get home, I spend the evening watching television instead. The issue is not that I did something morally bad. It is that my will is so weak, I cannot even do what I wish to do and what I intended to do when I got home. You see, we're all sinners. We each have a weak and defective will. Death is the only cure for a weak will. The only cure for sin. In my Protestant days, I was the pastor of a small country church. A young couple had two children, both diagnosed with neoblastoma, a cancer that strikes infants and children. The odds were astronomical that two children in the same family would have this kind of cancer. Tracy was seven when she died. The family had gathered in her hospital room when she died in her uncle's arms. Her father, racing to get there from work, walked in moments after she died. I was in the room. It was the first time I had ever seen a person die. Having killed Tracy, the cancer now furiously attacked her younger brother, Tony. With one child buried, the parents doubled their efforts in trying to save their remaining son. No stone was left unturned. No faith healer left not consulted. And no prayer left unprayed. 
but the cancer grew. The next six months were filled with emergency runs to the hospital for blood transfusions. Regularly scheduled cancer treatments were suffered and endured, but the cancer grew disfiguring the little boy's face. The physician treating Tony called me in. She explained everything had failed. The blood transfusions were no longer helping fight the cancer. In fact, the transfusions were now feeding the cancer, causing it to grow. She asked my assistance in standing with this young couple as they made the toughest decision any parents could ever make to stop the blood transfusions. These brave parents took Tony home. They didn't want him to die in a hospital like his sister. They called me that night. I went to their home. There were five of us there, the parents, me, the uncle holding Tony as he had Tracy. Two hours later, I called the hospital and told them Tony had died. I helped the father as he carried his son in his arms to the car as we took Tony's body to the hospital. The only way to kill the cancer was for Tony to die. The only way to kill the sin in us, to kill our weakened wills, is to die. Christ died on the cross to show us the death of sin. This is how sin dies. But how long does death last? And that brings us to the third step then, our nature became fallen with our weakened will causing us to make mistakes and only death conquers and defeats our weakened will and our sin. And that brings us then to the resurrection. On Sunday morning, the first day of the week, the myrrh-bearing women went to Christ's tomb to finish the funeral. They carried spices with them to perfume the body. At the tomb, they were confronted with the reality of the resurrection. The resurrection does not fit any human category. It is outside any matrix of th thought description beyond comprehension and beyond explanation the reality of the resurrection met them God gave Moses the pattern of the earthly tabernacle on Mount Sinai he told Moses to construct a box the ark to hold the Ten Commandments and its lid known as the mercy seat Facing each other on top of the mercy seat were the two cherubim, one on each end of the top with their outstretched wings pointing towards each other. God told Moses, and there I will meet with you and from above the mercy seat between the two cherubim which are upon the ark of the testimony. God does not meet us in the box with the Ten Commandments. He does not meet us in the box of legalism, rules, sin, punishment. He does not meet us in the box. He says, I will meet you at the mercy seat. I will meet you above the box between the wings of the cher uh, cherubim at the place of mercy. But Mary was standing outside the tomb 
weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped, and she looked into the tomb, and she beheld two angels in white sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. She saw that flat slab with an angel at each end where God said he would meet us between the angels at the place of mercy. It is in the resurrection of Jesus Christ that God meets us, not in the box, in the resurrection, the place of mercy. It is the resurrection of Jesus Christ that completes the restoration and makes possible for us our return to paradise. Jesus told Dismas, the penitent thief, today you will be with me in paradise. The Paschal, the Easter hymn, the Paschal Troparian declares, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs, bestowing life. In the refrains of the second antiphon of the divine liturgy we sing, O Son of God, who art risen from the dead, save us who sing unto thee. Hallelujah. O Son of God, who art risen from the dead, save us who sing unto thee. Hallelujah. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. O Son of God, who art risen from the dead, save us who sing unto thee, Alleluia. Only begotten Son and Word of God, who art immortal, who did condescend for our salvation to be incarnate, back here, to be incarnate of the holy Theotokos and ever Virgin Mary and without change was made man and was crucified. Also, O Christ our God, and by thy death didst death subdue, that's the resurrection, who art one of the Holy Trinity, glorified to God, together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, save us. The reality of the resurrection is real. Death kills our sin and our weakened wills, but Christ's resurrection defeated death. So how long does death last? St. Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He proclaimed that the death that had swallowed us had itself now been swallowed in victory. In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, what Hosea had foretold has come to pass. I will deliver them out of the hand of Hades, and I will redeem them from death. Where is your penalty, O death? O Hades, where is your sting? In the resurrection of Jesus Christ, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? At first, the disciples did not know what to think. They ran to the tomb and they found it empty, just like the women had said. Some believed. Others did not know what to believe. Then Christ, the risen Savior, appeared to them and they believed. All believed but Thomas, who was not there in the upper room that first Sunday, the day of resurrection. But he was there a week later when once more Christ appeared. In the face of revelation, Thomas no longer needed any empirical proof or rational explanation. He fell on his knees in worship, my Lord and my God. Thomas is not the great doubter. He is the great believer. If Christ has not been raised, then our faith is worthless. If Christ has not been raised, then everything we believe and proclaim 
is false and worthless. If we only follow the teachings of Christ as a moral guide that we find beneficial to us in this life, one among many guides chosen out of our personal preference, then St. Paul said, we are of all men most to be pitied. St. Thomas did not follow Jesus because he needed a moral code to follow. He fell on him, the risen Savior, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this present physical and empirical age in which we live, Thomas is the saint for this age, demanding the physical he fell on his knees before that which he could not explain. May we be as honest as he. Our response. We gather every week on Sunday, the first day of the week, to celebrate the resurrection. At Pascha, and for 40 days thereafter, we sing the Pascha hymn, the Troparian of Pascha, Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. And in addition to the Troparian, the, that one, the hymn of the resurrection, the Orthodox Church has eight other hymns of the resurrection. We sing a different one each Sunday for eight weeks, and then we cycle through them again. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is our victory over death. We proclaim it every Sunday. Like Thomas, we proclaim my Lord and my God by declaring the resurrection every Sunday. And we sing one of these hymns in sequence. The first hymn, tone one. The stone being sealed by the Jews and thy pure body being guarded by the soldiers. Thou didst rise on the third day, O Savior, granting life to the world. Wherefore the heavenly powers acclaim thee, O giver of life, crying glory to thy resurrection, O Christ. Glory to thy kingdom, glory to thy gracious providence, O thou only lover of mankind. And the next week, when thou, O immortal life, didst humble thyself unto death, then, then didst thou destroy death by the brightness of thy Godhead. And when thou didst raise the bowels of the earth, then all the heavenly powers exclaimed, O Christ, Thou art the giver of life. Glory to thee, O our God. The third week, let the heavens rejoice and the earth be glad, for the Lord has done a mighty act with his own arm. He has trampled down death and become the firstborn from the dead. He has delivered us from the depth of Hades, granting to the world the great mercy. The fourth week, having learned the joyful message of the resurrection from the angel, the women, disciples, cast from them their parental condemnation and proudly broke the news to the disciples, saying, Death has been spoiled. Christ God is risen, granting the world great mercy. For week five, let us believers praise and worship the Word, co-eternal with the Father and the Spirit, born of the Virgin for our salvation. For he took pleasure in ascending the cross in the flesh to suffer death and to raise the dead by his glorious resurrection. Week 6, when Mary stood at thy grave, looking for thy sacred body, 
angelic powers shone above thy revered tomb. And the soldiers who were keeping guard became as dead men. Thou led Hades captive and was not tempted thereby. Thou didst meet the virgin and didst give life to the world. O thou that art risen from the dead, O Lord, glory to thee. And then week seven, thou didst shatter death by thy cross. Thou didst open paradise to the thief. Thou didst turn the sadness of the ointment-bearing women into joy, and didst bid thine apostles proclaim a warning that thou had risen, O Christ, granting the world great mercy. And then for week eight, O compassionate one, thou didst descend from the heights, thou didst submit to the three-day burial, that thou mightest deliver us from passion. Thou art our life and our resurrection. O Lord, glory to thee. We stand in awe in the presence of the resurrection. We cannot explain the resurrection. We do not try. We stand in awe and we worship. In our worship, we tell what God has done. Holy Trinity, you have done this and this. But we do not stop with only a recital of what God has done. We then respond to what God has done. Therefore, glory to thee. We worship standing in awe before the mystery of God in our lives. We worship. You see, for us, the dead aren't dead. The dead aren't dead. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. For us, the dead aren't dead. They are alive in Christ. He bestows life upon those in the tombs. Thou didst shatter death by thy cross. Thou didst open paradise to the thief. Dismas, the penitent thief, is not dead. Nor is St. Thomas dead. Both are invisibly present with us during our worship. They are part of the cloud of witnesses that surrounds us as they and we worship the undivided Trinity simultaneously together in the liturgy. It is Thomas that leads us in declaring in worship, my Lord and my God. We point to Dismas when we say, but like the thief will I confess thee, Remember me, O Lord, in thy kingdom. Our departed loved ones in the Lord are not dead. They are alive in Christ. They are invisibly present during the liturgy, worshiping the undivided Trinity alongside us. Jesus told us, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you may be also. Now notice he said, where I am you may be also. Christ is invisibly present with us as the high priest and liturgist of our worship. Christ tells us where I am, you will be. Christ is invisibly present, and our Lord are invisibly present where he is. Hear the words of Christ. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me shall live, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. 
Look at that again. I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me shall live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes shall never die. What does that mean? It means if we are now baptized, chrismated, receiving the life of God in us as a follower being restored through the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection of Christ to be living now, even in our fallen human body, in paradise, beginning to have eyesight and hearing restored so that we begin to know what we know without knowing how we know it. We are alive now with Christ and the moment of our death comes, even though we die, we have not died. We are still alive as we were. If we're alive on this side of death, in Him, we are alive on the other side of death. Oh, death, where is your sting? It's gone. Wow! This is real. It's not a myth. It's the truth. And it is this is the gospel that conquered the Roman Empire. This is the unchanged gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that cannot be explained, that he's here, we worship him, amen, glory to thee. Wow, you can get excited about this. Thou did shatter death by thy cross. My death will kill my wishy-washy will. It'll kill my weak will and the missing of the mark that it brings. But Christ tells us that even if we die, we shall never die. He says, because I live, you shall live also. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. The dead aren't dead. Through Adam and Eve, we lost paradise. We lost the kingdom of God. We lost the ability to live in a world that united the seen and the unseen. Paradise never left. It became invisible. The kingdom of God never left. We lost the eyesight with which to see it. Our ears became deaf to God's voice. But in the fullness of time, the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. Through the incarnation, God united divinity and humanity within himself as fully God and fully man. Through the crucifixion, our weak wills will die in our own death. And through the resurrection, the dead aren't dead. Through his incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection, God has opened paradise to the thief. He has reopened paradise for all who believe. Christ stands over the shattered gates of Hades and releases Adam and Eve and restores them to paradise with him. We sing the blessing hymn in Orthros, the morning Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. The company of the angels was amazed when they beheld thee numbered among the dead Yet thyself, O Savior, destroying the power of death, and with thee raising Adam, and releasing all men from hell. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Wherefore, O women disciples, do you mingle sweet-smelling spices with your tears of pity? The radiant angel within the sepulcher cried unto the myrrh-bearing women, Behold the grave and understand, for the Savior is risen from the tomb. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. Very early in the morning did the myrrh-bearing women run lamenting to thy tomb. But an angel came toward them, saying, 
the time for lamentation has passed. Weep not, but announce unto the apostles the resurrection. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. The murmuring women mourned as bearing spices. They drew near thy tomb, O Savior. But an angel spake unto them, saying, Why number ye the living among the dead? In that he is God, he is risen from the grave. Repent and enter paradise. To the living and to those in the tombs, Christ proclaims a single message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, for paradise is at hand. The message of the resurrection is a singular message proclaimed to the living and to those in the tombs. Death is defeated. Paradise is reopened to those who will enter. And in our funeral service we sing, Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. The choirs of the saints have found the fountain of life and the door of paradise May I also find the right way through repentance. I am a lost sheep. Call me, O Savior, and save me. Blessed art thou, O Lord, teach me thy statutes. I am an image of thy glory ineffable. Though I bear the brands of transgressions, show thy compassions upon thy creature, O Master, and purify me by thy loving kindness and grant me the home country of my heart's desire, making me again a citizen of paradise. I will not give thee a kiss as did Judas, but like the thief I will confess thee. Remember me, O Lord, in thy kingdom. Here already, now already, the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom of God that has been invisibly present all along is now once more accessible. The kingdom of God in which the visible and the invisible, the heavenly and the earthly, the divine and the human dwell simultaneously is at hand. Paradise is reopened. Repent and believe the gospel. I think we'll take our break and we'll come back and see what's left for us to talk about. So God bless you for being here. Those of you that came after I tried to check my role so I can get names, if you'll come see me real quick, I'll make sure I've got a good head count of, of how many we had here tonight. Those of you on, uh, on Zoom and those of you watching on video, uh, we'll be back in just a few minutes. Thanks. Okay, this brings us then to chapter 10 in finding the church that Jesus built, the new edition. The end. You will recall uh, several weeks ago when we started in our first episode together, we talked about Indiana Jones looking for uh, historical archaeological artifacts. And so I'm going to close with references to Indiana Jones as well. In two of the Indiana Jones Hollywood movies, the goal in those movies was to find a religious artifact. In Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Nazis sought the lost ark for the power they believed the ark possessed or the power it gave those who possessed the ark. Indiana Jones dismissed the existential realities present in the ark as hocus pocus and wanted to study the ark for its archeological, empirical value for a museum and the film ended with the lost ark once more buried, this time by government bureaucracy. 
The audience in that movie, like the Lost Ark itself, left where they began. The Ark was buried. We came in as spectators and we left as spectators. An hour and 45 minutes later, entertained by the search for the Lost Ark, the audience left without an encounter with the exorcist at the heart of the ark. And the message of the film was quite clear. Religious realities are dangerous and to be avoided while caring for your immediate circle of friends is the real treasure. Well, sometimes a movie is worth a sequel. Having tampered with the arc of ancient Israelite Jewish religion in the first film, the last crusade took on Christianity by searching for the chalice of the grail legends of medieval Europe. The last crusade turned the Arthurian legend, the legends of Arthur, on its head replacing Guinevere with Elsa, Arthur with Henry Jones, and Lancelot with Indiana Jones. The Last Crusade approached existential realities as a literal leap of faith and the importance of choosing wisely before it quickly demonstrated how dangerous and destructive religious faith becomes by having it nearly cost Indiana Jones his life. Once more, the message of the film is quite clear. In Raiders of the Lost Ark and The Last Crusade, Indiana Jones embodies the skepticism towards Judeo-Christianity prevalent in secular America. But like Indiana Jones, we set out to find a religious artifact for ourselves, the church that Jesus built. Like Indiana Jones, we found what we were looking for. We have not been spectators, but participants in this search. Like Indiana Jones, we have found what we set out to find. However, this is not a Hollywood movie. We are not actors pretending to be someone else. There is no written script telling us what we will do now, what happens next. In one way, instead of being actors, we're more like screenwriters. Instead of deciding what each character will do, we get to decide what one particular character gets to do. Since we are playing ourselves, we get to decide what we want us, our character, to do now. Perhaps like Indiana Jones, we're only interested in the existence of an external artifact. We've centered in on the history and the historical realities. Perhaps it is the visible icons or the incense or the prayer ropes and the Jesus prayer that intrigues us. Perhaps we may not be interested at all in the invisible presence everywhere present and filling all things. Indiana Jones chose to ignore the existence of the Grail Knight and the miraculous healing of his father, preferring instead to jump on his horse at sunset. However, this is not a Hollywood movie, nor is it a Hollywood script. This is real. You are real. The church we found is real. Now whether you remain on the outside with only the 
empirical historical reality is totally up to you you can walk away the same as from a movie as a spectator that has I hope at least enjoyed the journey others of us have become participants making this journey desiring to see what is inside desiring to enter into the existential realities that are invisibly present inside the empirical and as Moses did so long ago you desire to turn aside and see for yourself what kind of fire it is that burns inside this burning bush and for you this is not the end this is the beginning I think at the very least you have discovered that you found what you did not know you were looking for well God bless you for being on this journey with us together and uh, those of you that are here uh, we will come again next week and we'll talk over and have a question and answer time and we'll take a tour of the church for those of you that are watching this on YouTube I would encourage you to see if you can find an Orthodox Church within driving distance call and make an appointment with the priest or someone there on the staff that you could meet with and talk about tell him you've taken this class and you're wanting to know a little more and have him show you the church and so forth you see for those of us that that's the case it's not the end it's now a beginning so God bless you for being here we'll see everyone next week thank you bless the Lord O my soul blessed art thou O Lord bless the Lord O my soul and all that is within me, bless his holy name.